Isaiah 55, it says this, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore, why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth, and make it, it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. That will conclude our reading this evening. And we're going to take a specific interest in, though we'll comment about multiple verses in here. We're going to take specific interest in verse 10 and 11. And I'll read verse 11 for you again. It says this, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Now, the title of our message tonight is The Word of the Lord. The Word of the Lord. But it's not perhaps in the way that we often think of it in the sense of what we're reading from tonight. Um, This is often referred to both in the Bible and by us as the Word of God and the Word of the Lord. And it is. God, as we read throughout scriptures, uh, we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all scripture is given by inspiration. Um, We find in the book of Peter that it is... What Peter says, not in the King James, but in the original, it is God breathed. And so we know that God is the ultimate author. Obviously, in the first five books, Moses was inspired to write about things that had transpired the 2,500 years before he lived. Well, how did he know about those things? Well, God spoke to him. God is the one that gave him the wisdom and the knowledge to pin those things down. And that is the word of the Lord. And so there's a sense to which we obviously can look to these scriptures as the word of the Lord. But I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I don't think he's talking about the word of God in the sense of a written word. I want you to notice this evening exactly how it's worded. He says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Him, his word, out of his mouth. Now, today there is a significant movement, and I'm not going to detail where I think some of it comes from, but like we know most things, things go on a pendulum very often. And when things get a little too far one direction, then people recognize the error of the way and the temptation within human nature seems to be, and we can look at this and 
almost every aspect down through history, that the pendulum begins to come back, and very often people take the response too far. And so there's a movement in religion today, and perhaps there is some of it that is very good. And the idea goes something like this. In past years, there was not an emphasis placed upon the study of God's word, both as ministers and as laymen. And so very often it was not, uh, it was not an uncommon thing to see preachers get up, and I'm sure you have heard it before, almost boast in their ignorance and talk about, I'm just going to let the Spirit of the Lord lead me and talk about all types of other things and not really get to much truth that's found in God's Word. And there seemed to at times be almost a competition of how backwoods and uneducated you could get and then how much you could brag about it before the congregation. I remember, uh, and you've, I'm sure, heard this before, a preacher telling a, a young preacher, don't, don't get up and tell them what you don't know at the beginning of the sermon just wait five minutes and in five minutes they'll know, right? Uh, and certainly there's some truth to that. And in modern day now, where everything is placed under a microscope, where learning, at least in a formal sense, and I emphasize that, formal learning is emphasized. That is, get your degrees, at least appear educated and appear smart, not just from a religious standpoint, but also from a secular one. There is great emphasis placed on this written word. And I believe some of that emphasis has done a lot of good. That there are things by studying God's word, this book is a, a book of history. It's a book of wisdom. It's a book that helps us to know how to build our relationships so it functions as a, a counselor to us. There, it, it reproves us of our sins. There are so many here, it helps us to budget our finances. There are so many principles that we can find that are applicable to many areas of life. And so just a cursory study of this book from someone who is not digging for spiritual meat, but is looking for practical help, it would be a value to you. It would be a value to me to just read the Bible and apply the principles therein. And yet, as the pendulum continues to swing, and as more emphasis gets placed on the written word, there is a danger. There is a danger in that the power is viewed as in these written words and not in the author. Now, If you'll notice in verse 11, exactly how it's worded, he says this, so shall my word be, and then he adds this next little phrase, it's very important, that cometh forth out of my mouth. You and I both have heard, you've heard me, no doubt, get up, and the unction of the Holy Spirit has not been as as present as what we wished it would have been. Good instruction, good many things, but there's an emptiness to it. There's a hollowness that doesn't resonate in the same way, and yet, you, and, and yet it can be filled with all sorts of scripture and Bible quotations, Bible references to different examples who illustrate all of these different things. Many times you'll see, especially amongst young preachers, get an obsession with the Greek and the original language and, and all these big things, and yet... The one thing that it is void of is the one thing that God says here is what will ensure its effectiveness in the hearts of the hearers. And that is that it would be God's voice speaking, not the voice of men. It's essential for all of us. One of the uh, things that I would encourage our church towards is that we need to be mindful when we're in the house of God and in the service of God that the things which God is revealing to us in our private lives, whether they're in our private devotionals, whether they're in experiences that we have, whether it's in our private studies, maybe it's something you hear from the pulpit or something that somebody in your Sunday school class teaches you. And those things begin to resonate in your heart and God begins to move those things and begin to change you and confront you about certain things. It is a vital thing that in the same sense that God has spoken to you beyond 
respond just to man and man's instructions when you know that that word has come from the Lord and it is molding and affecting and shaping you. The next step is to pray, God, when you give me the word, allow me to share your word that would come from you. We've seen in our revivals over the next, the last three revivals that we've had. Times when after the preaching was done, the preaching, the the preachers did a fine job and there was nothing to complain about. But we've all been in those services where it wasn't until after the sermon that God really began to speak to the hearts of his people or the hearts of lost people. And so what do we have to do? We have to be mindful as vessels of the Lord or possible mouthpieces of the Lord that when God begins to speak in you, Realize its end destination might not be you, but what he might choose to do is use you to get that same message through you to other people. Here, what matters in short is not how necessarily biblical and truthful something is, but it's who's saying it. Who is the person? I would say in modern day what If you want to pray for me as your pastor, that's what you need to pray. Not for all the the logistical things that can go on behind the pulpit and me stuttering around and stammering around and misquoting things or having some fluidity of speech. But what you want, what you need, what I need is for God to speak. Why? Why do we need God to speak? Well, it tells us here. Because when God speaks, there is something guaranteed. That's a great thing. When I, you know, I think of our, our, uh, your prayers about when you're teaching your children. So we're having these Wednesday night Bible studies, and you men are, are being put in this position where you're having to teach your children. And, and so, in some sense, you're experiencing to some degree what a, a preacher does. Whenever he first gets called to preach, you're doing this unnatural thing that maybe you've never done before to this extent. And you're saying, well, this is kind of odd. And, and so your mind starts going to a whole lot of things, right? How am I going to get this out? And how am I going to make my, my kids understand this? And all these thoughts go through your mind. And certainly those things are natural. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with making provisions to do those things. But in your process of making provisions to teach your children, recognize that the most important ingredient is that God would speak through you when you're meeting with your wife and it's just the two of you. You can go through the lesson and it can be quick and, and you can seemingly understand what Christ is getting at there in, in, uh, in John 15 or what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians 13 or, or maybe the story that, who is it, Matthew's telling us this week and the, 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 the example with Peter walking on the water. There's certainly truth to just getting that information out. But isn't it the purpose? Isn't why God wants us to come together as a family and look to his word is not just so that dad will speak. Not just so that mom will give some biblical instruction. Isn't it truly that we want God to speak? Because when God speaks, notice here, he has a purpose that he is intending to accomplish. You know, one of the amazing things that as a preacher, and I don't usually talk about preachers and preaching very much, but one of the things that I experience, I don't want to say normally, but periodically, is when in your mind you're preparing your sermon and, and, and you're preparing your thoughts and you're reading the Word and you're studying the Word, and, and I guess it's just natural to think this is the demographic of people this, this message would typically go to, or this is the takeaway. This is what most people would take away as the main point. And then you get up and preach, and the Lord does something very different than what you had thought about. Or what somebody gets is altogether different than anything you had on your mind. And yet that person is profoundly affected by that. Now on the giving side of it, what I do is I chuckle and I say, well, that just reaffirms that had nothing to do with me because he got that or she got that in spite of my intent God had an intent and this word is telling us but it shall accomplish that which I please 
what amazes me is when God's word goes out and he is doing something and I'm just completely naive to it and I'm thinking I'm the vessel by which this is being done and then he reminds me, no, I'm speaking. Here, he says, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. He gave an analogy and he says that what it's like is when the rain comes down. Now, I found it very interesting and maybe somebody can help me with this at some point after service, but... In verse 10 it says, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither. I never noticed that phrase before. And returneth not thither. That seems to me what it's talking about is is rain falls, and then what happens? It goes back up to the sky into the clouds, and then it falls again. Now they didn't scientifically know this, but God did. Isn't that kind of neat? He knew that was the case, and so he shows us that in his word and he says it doesn't return before it does this waters the earth and brings forth fruit so it seems to me that there are often two things that are going on when people are trying to deliver God's word there are some people who become so obsessed with technical accuracy right now that's amazing I'm going to get off sidetrack for just a moment from this Here's the amazing thing about somebody who overemphasizes the technical words rather than God speaking. If we look back through history, here's what we're going to find. For 2,500 years, there was no written word. So how did God speak? Well, he spoke to people's hearts, both himself or through other people. That's what he did. Then Moses comes and he writes the word. And over the next 1,500 years... There is the accomplishment of the written word of the Old Testament. So prophets are coming, and yet still, those scrolls were not disseminated to people. They didn't have access to those things like we do in this handy little binded book where they just take it home and get it out whenever they want to. No, there was a time and place where they would go and they would hear the scrolls read and interpreted by uh, some Jewish leader of some sort. When they went into bondage, they didn't have normal access to the written word of God just at their convenience. And so we have the first 4,000 years of the Old Testament where there is no, I'll say, direct access for the layman or even for a religious person to the the written word of God. And yet what do we find throughout the Old Testament is that God has revealed himself over and over and over directly to the human heart because that's what God is about is speaking to people himself. We get to the New Testament and finally after the first 90 years or so after Jesus' birth, We have the completion of what we would call the canon of scriptures. All 66 books now. And yet just because they're finished and John hit the final period in the book of Revelation doesn't mean that the people have it. Right? Because then we go through these periods of history called the Dark Ages where the masses are left in complete ignorance, are left in complete uh, illiteracy, where you're talking about 80 and 90% of Europe being completely illiterate. So even if they had access to the word of God, even if it's sitting right in front of them, they can't read it if it's in their language. But then there was this, there was this uh, conspiracy by a certain group of people to make sure not only will the people not be able to read, but if they could read, it's in a foreign language that they don't understand. It's in Latin. So we're going to get up, we're going to learn Latin, and then we're just going to tell them what they says. And they get up and do that. And finally, over the course, and I, I'm, I'm being very general here, but over the course of the next 1,500 years from the time that Christ is born until the King James Version of the Bible, which became the most popular version that was spread out, finally, after the invention of the printing press, after all these things have taken place, now the common layman has access to what we would consider the Word of God. And yet still... The cost was prohibitive. There were many other things that had to take place before the way that we treat the word of God was accessible to the people. Now, why am I bringing all that up? Because here's the reason. All of that time, almost 6,000 years of time has passed, and yet nobody has access to this, or few do in its complete form, and yet God still is writing here in the book of Isaiah that my word is going out out of my mouth and will prosper. 
The most important thing for someone who is a Christian, even beyond being schooled in the education of the Bible, is to know God's voice and hear it regularly. I can go through exercises. I hope you do. I hope you do this. I hope you go through exercises in some capacity, even in the midst of, of you know, child rearing like Kathleen and I have. It's a hard thing to do to set some kind of a regimen and say, I'm going to read the Bible every day. I hope you do that. But that can be a checklist item. And very often for people who are checklist items, they get in the habit of saying in their mind, well, I've done my deed today. I've read the word of God. Check, let's move on. If that's what's giving you the clarity of conscience, let me try to disturb your conscience for a moment and say that's not the point. The point is that God wants to speak to you. I'm not going to deny anything that says the word of God is a primary vehicle God uses to do that. That's obviously the case. Many men and women rightfully went through a great deal of thing. And I know somebody hearing this could accuse me of saying, you know, you're diminishing the importance of the Bible. I'm not whatsoever. More of my time is spent studying this than probably doing anything else. Because that's how valuable it is. That's how important the insights that are gained. That's the responsibility that I believe God's ministers have to bring the gospel. Is that you got to know it and you got to share it. But even beyond that, what is of more integral need is that God is speaking through it. Don't allow your checklist of reading the Bible. In other words, don't allow the Bible to get in the way of hearing from God. That sounds like a paradox, doesn't it? And yet I would say for a great deal of people today, it can be the case. It was the case during Jesus' time. John chapter 5, here what we, here's what we read. Jesus is talking to these Jewish elites. And they're complic- completely, as they often did, missing the point. And here's what he says to them. Search ye the scriptures, for in them ye think you have eternal life. You think you do. And they are they which testify of me. Verse 40 says this. But you will not come to me that you might have life. In other words, do you know what was getting in their way from hearing God? This. God in the flesh, John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. And let me say this, I don't want to pair the word of God against God himself, but what I will say is this, if Jesus walked in the room tonight, I would shut my Bible and go sit at his feet and listen to what the word of God has to say. Because he is the word, he's the embodiment, he's the... He's at all. This is meant to be the treasure map that leads us where? To the treasure. But what, what fool getting to the treasure would obsess over the map when he found it? Only a fool would do that. All this, there are people, there are preachers go through all this anguish, all this focus, all this in, intensity, just and I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling as though I'm coming off to an extreme and I don't mean to, but all this emphasis on the knowledge of the word and yet choking it of God, what, God, what God intends it to be. That's one group. Here's where God wants it right. Where a group of people says this, God, I know that in your word is truth. It's like Solomon when the queen of Sheba came and she said, the half has never been told all of your wisdom and riches. The Bible is that. The wisdom and riches in this book are so profound, so awe-inspiring that the half has literally never been told of all the people, of all the preachers, of all the testimonies, of all the Sunday school teachers, the half has never been told the depth of the richness of the word of God that I'm holding in my hand right here. And yet at the same time that we would go to God and we would say, Lord, I know that beneath the surface of these words is something powerful, real, life-altering, It's not in the words. It's in the words God speaks. So, Lord, enliven this to me. Help me to know 
experimentally, through experience, the richness of your word. If you've studied God's word for any, any length of time, I hope that you have had the experience. If you haven't, I pray to God that he would give it to you. That when you hear it preached, when you hear it talked about, when you read it yourself, when you discuss it, before you're doing that, continuously pray to the Lord, Lord, open my eyes, open my heart. Don't let me be like those religious elites who, when Jesus spoke to them, he says, you have ears that don't hear, you have eyes that do not see, and you have a heart that is hardened to the gospel. And yet they were experts at it, quoting long sections of the Old Testament that nobody in modern day would dare even learn to memorize and quote. They could do all of that, and yet they were completely ignorant of it at the same time. What do we want? We want God to speak to us. The reason, there may be people, if I chose a text out of the Bible and said, you know what, I think that Brother Danny needs this, so I'm going to preach it and hope it helps him. You know, it might. It might. But I don't know, it might not. He might not want to hear it. It might not be the right timing. I might do a not a good job articulating it. All these different things might be the case. But if I pray, maybe you see some of the flaws of your brothers and sisters, maybe your family members, and you want to intervene and you want to say something, you want to do something, and you want to help correct the error of their way. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, Lord, please let me go talk to Brother Danny. But I just don't feel right about it. He's not going to hear me or we don't have that good of a relationship to talk about that. You know, all these things. Let me give you a piece of advice about your prayer. Pray, Lord, speak to him. And if that requires me, send me. But if not, send whomever will help him to hear. Here's what it told us earlier in the text. It said this, and I'm going to close. Verse 2, he said, Hearken diligently unto me. Verse 3, he says, Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. Hear, and your soul shall live. That hearing has been simplified in modern religion today to a sickening point. All you got to do is say words, hear words, repeat words, write it in your Bible. Here's a verse that will ensure that you truly have been saved. He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, you call on the name of the Lord, you're saved. It's words. It's not a reality. In the same, now please hear me and I'm done. In the same sense which modernists have got it wrong, we too can get it wrong. Not in regards to salvation. In regards to the the other things that God desires to speak to us. In other words, we don't preach to people. God will speak to you when you're, you're saved and it will be this supernatural experience. It is. You're right. But that's not been, be, meant to be the only supernatural experience where you hear what God has to say. There is this perpetual. We've talked for two weeks now about the high priest standing in the presence of God and hearing that we have this benefit, this access to God, and we stand there. We have a right to be without the veil between us in his presence. What other purpose did Christ have when he tore the veil than that we would remain in his presence and commune with him? That communing is a reciprocal act. I speak to him, and guess what? He speaks back. It's not always that way. It doesn't happen like that because of our fallen nature. But I guess the emphasis I would place tonight is, when was the last time that God spoke to you? When was the last time that his word, through the preaching of the message, through the testimony of God's people, through some facet, when was the last time that God's word spoke really spoke to you. I can tell you a way you'll find out. When you saw an effect. You really saw an effect. That's what he was saying there in Isaiah 55. It's assured that whatever mouth, what words come out of his mouth, they'll have the effect that, last part, he intended. God intended to have. That's the effect it's going to have. I pray tonight, that's our message this evening, 
The word of God, Hebrews tells us, is sharp and powerful. More than a two-edged sword. Dividing asunder soul and spirit and the joints of the marrows and discerning the thoughts and the intents of the heart. I've heard more sermons than I can count saying that's this. I'm not so sure that that's a complete message. That's this with the Spirit of God speaking it. Um, I pray tonight in some way that if it does anything, it would stir you to the Lord, that it would cause you not to be satisfied with truth alone, something that's right, truthful, regardless of its source, but that you would be desirous to hear beyond words and hear the Lord speak. That's our message tonight. I pray that God would use it in your heart as, as he sees fit.